So uh, I'm here to talk about the Yocto project, extensible SDK, and how it can make life easier for application developers. Nice to see a full room, so thank you to my pitch man, Tim Orling. And uh, let's see if, <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll start off with what we'll be covering. First, first of all, why do we need an extensible SDK? And to kind of help guide me through the talk, what will be interesting is, uh, can I have a show of hands for anyone who's used a Yocto SDK or Application Development Toolkit, as it used to be called? Thank you. How about those of you who have worked with the extensible SDK, the later version of that? That is so good and bad. Bad that no one's used it, but good. I'm here to show you what, uh, what it's about and how it can help. So we'll talk about how application uh, developers are going to use it and why we thought it was worthwhile developing. Also, once we've covered that, to show how it's going to make their life easier, we're also going to talk about uh, what you have to do as a distro maintainer. A little, a little bit more you have to do to conf configure. We'll see how it affects th their lives. And then we'll have a show uh, how it sort of pulls, to, pulls, to, pulls to together the lives of the distro maintainer and application to developers and kind of show you an end-to-end -end workflow. And just as a heads up before I start, this will not be a dev tool deep, deep, deep dive. Dev tool is a tool delivered by the extensible SDK. Tim Orling gave an excellent talk yes, 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 yesterday where he covered all the, all the details of that. So I will be skimming over DevTool, and if you're not aware of it, if you missed Tim's talk, you'll find it uh, on the slides, but I'm afraid I don't have time to go into detail. Just a heads up on that one. Okay, so we'll start by saying, you know, what is extensible SDK? Why did it come into fruition? We'll start by reference. I talked about the standard SDK. It sounds like quite a lot of you have used it. So as you'll know, that is designed to develop code uh, to run on a target, a target machine. Standard cross-development cross de uh, approach. It was uh, delivered as a shell script, shell script installer. So you would get uh, all the host uh, tool, tool chain, uh, all the libraries, symbols and stuff that would be uh, built and deployed on the target, and also an environment setup script. So once you run that script, it would set up all the environment variables, so it would invoke the correct compiler, linker, and those, and those tools. So that's been around for a few years. I should have done my homework and know exactly how long, but um, five plus years that guy's been around. So during that time, we've learned a few things. First of all, as I mentioned, it's uh, delivered as a shell script installer. If you've got a fairly complex target, large number of libraries on it, few applications, that installer can quickly approach a gigabyte and get larger. So if that SDK is under maintenance, libraries are being fixed, the regular continuous into, into integration, you'll be getting up, up, updates. So you're dealing with pulling down a gigabyte installer every so often, reinstalling it, having to move over to a new workspace. It's all a, a little, little bit of a pain. So how could we improve, improve that? How could we make it extensible? Same as updatable, really, but rather than fixing things that are there, you're adding new things. So your platform had, say, an ambient light sensor. No one had written a library for it. Now you do have a library. It's now been extended. How can you use that? So standard SDK also was all about building binaries that would run on your platform. But as you know, to incorporate that into a Yocto build, you have to convert the source code that's going to generate your binary into a recipe. So the distro maintainer can take that on board, make a package, add that to the build. But you're just generating binaries. How can you get to recipes? So um, we want to help, uh, help you out and kind of automate that process so you don't have to build, bring a recipe expert down into your world as the app, app devel devel developer. It would also be great if you could build not just binaries, but how about a whole image plus your binary? Because what you'll do, you'll have your hardware, target hardware with the image. They're going to add your new application push your application on there, make sure it all runs. How about you want to share that between a few co-workers? Co co you have to go and repeat that setup. Wouldn't it be easier if you could somehow build, build an image? Just give them that, that, that image. And you pull all the things I've talked about, all, the, all these improvements, if they were all there, teamwork and develop, developer flow, 
that would be a lot easier. So we thought about this and came up with the concept of the extensible SDK. So it's a major design change over the standard, the standard SDK. You're not simply getting a tool chain and libraries. Now, essentially, you're getting a shrink wrap, full scale developer distro, distro de developer environment. So uh, this will also come as a compact, compact installer. Because we thought people were not very happy about having to deal with gigabyte installers, plus the fact they might be working on a small, a small part. If you've got a complex system, you're just working as one sensor, why should you have to install gigabytes of Dictator if you're only, only going to be using a very small part of that? So you can configure it to have a small, um, a small installer, smaller 35 uh, megabytes. The way that works is a whole system is updatable and, and extensible through, through, through lazy install. So in other words, the tools and libraries are pulled down when you need them. This will also simplify the, uh, the teamwork, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Now, the extensible SDK, sort of code for it first appeared in, in Jethro, although it was in Krogoth, really, that it delivered its full, its full, its full power. And we're investing in that, and uh, it's getting in improvements in every release. So now let's talk about using it. If you're an application developer, uh, how do you use this thing? So first of all, obviously, you need to install it. Installer, that's created by the, the distro maintainer. As for the standard SDK, comes in a shell script installer, although now it can be a lot smaller. Uh, it's completely self-contained, so it should have no dependencies on your build, your build, your build, uh, your build host. Also, it can be installed to uh, an arb arbitrary location, so a relocatable installer. So I'll just show you a, a quick example of how you might install it. First of all, your distro your developer will give you an installer. It'll have, a, it'll have a name a bit like this. It will involve the distro name. In this case, it's just Pocky, the default. And uh, in here, it's targeting an i586-based uh, target. So you download that, make sure it's ex executable, and then you run it. Uh, note the minus D option. This will uh, put it to a location of your, of your choice. If you don't use, use this, it'll default to somewhere in slash opt, and that means you need administra administrative privileges to do any further downloads or up updates. It can be a bit of a pain. So I would advise putting it somewhere local where you have full permissions. So then you just simply run the, run the installer, and it's tell you what it's going to do, what, what version it is, where it's going to install it. It'll run through, do its install. You'll see there's, there's a bit of bit bake here happening, but it doesn't take all that long to, to install. This is actually a small, a minimal installer. So it took 17 seconds. This was a fairly old uh, four-core i7 machine. Uh, then it's, it's done, and after it's done, it shows this is the environment setup script I've been, I've been talking, talking about. So at this point, uh, you want to make a note, a note of this. You don't really need to remember the whole, the whole name because this will be the only environment setup script that exists in this folder. Okay, so let's look at a very simple, a simple example. So this assumes that the, the ESDK installer contains a tool tool chain. We'll talk about that later, what I'm really meaning there. But uh, in this case, we run the environment script I've just thought about, I've just talked, talked about, and then uh, we just do a very simple compilation. And we just run a, run a hello pro, 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 program, push that all to the target. So no change here, really, over the standard S SDK. So it's just showing that the extensible SDK, although we've added features, it's backward compatible with the standard SDSDK. Allows Eclipse into integration as you've had in the, in the past, but also it's uh, updatable, unlike, unlike the standard SDK. And I'll talk a bit more how that, how, that, how that happens. So the key thing is it's got access to new tools. Now when, when I say new, these are not new to Yocta Project, but they're new to SDK users. Essentially, you're gonna get access to most of the, of the distro tools. The main one you have access to is, uh, is DevTool, because this will certainly give you an easy to use gateway into the key tools. But also you've got access to, to Recipe Tool if you know how to, how to use, 
use, use that, want to do some real customization of some, uh, of some recipes from, from source code. Uh, it'll do access to WIC if you want to do image configuration, a lot of the tools. Also, run, run QMU. So if you have a target that's uh, QMU, you can actually run QMU from your SDK, which is pretty cool. So you can have an instant target. So if we'll do an example dev tool workflow, so as I mentioned, this is the key tool delivered by the extensible SDK. And again, I'm just going to touch on this. It was Tim covered this in detail. So again, we start off by running the environment setup script. But now we're going to get a lot more than just a compiler. So now we've got, we've got dev tool, and we're going to do dev tool add. So what's happening here? You point it to a repo. It's got a project in it. In this case, a simple auto tools project. A lot of you might know the venerable BB example. So it's going to pull that down and generate a recipe. You can have a quick look at the recipe here. See, uh, look, look what it's done, check everything's right. Then you just do a build. And then you just deploy it to your target, assuming you have a network connection. Then you do your run, fix, repeat until you're happy with what you've got. And then you do dev tool finish. So what this will do is it will publish um, the recipe to uh, and any, any patches caused by your changes. Um, and, we'll, and we'll publish all that to a layer. In this case, it's just assumed that you've made a fork of the layer that the distro maintainer will be adding to his, his, his build. And once you've pu published there, you've issued a, a pull request, let the distro maintainer know. So he can then uh, pull that and then publish an ESDK with your work in it. In it. So now everybody, everybody else in your team has got access to the enhanced BB example. So we talked about the big deal about the extensible SDK is that you can now up, update it. So one of the big commands here is uh, using dev tool, dev tool again is SDK up, update. So what's going what's to happen here when you run this, and you should run this on a regular basis, usually you'll get a heads up from your, from your distro maintainer uh, that there's a change to uh, be aware of. But it runs very quickly. And the reason for that is it doesn't pull down all the changes that, that, that have been made. It's just, just aware of the changes to the metadata that has been published. So in other words, it's now aware of any package version updates, new tools, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to extend your SDK, so now you want to pull, pull something down and play with it, uh, you can use DevTool to search for what applications and libraries you might, you might be able to have access to. And if you find what you want, you can use the SDK install. So the minus S that's in brackets there, that says you can pull down the source code if your distro maintainer has not already built it. And then you can build it yourself locally. So we'll talk about later how we can also leverage some of the pre-built artifacts that your distro maintainer has, has, has created. So I have, a, I have an example here of, let's say you have the small installer, the 35 meg, megabyte one. You can just uh, use S, S, SDK install to pull down the, the, tool, the tool chain. And now you'd be in a situation that's quite similar to the standard, the standard SDK if you want to follow that the development model. You can also do everything that I've talked about in a container. Hopefully, you attended Randy Witt's uh, talk earlier today when he was talking about containers. If you did, you would have heard him talk about one of the containers that was available is for the extensible SDK. What the container does there, and I'll not go into details here because uh, that's all covered in, in his talk, but essentially, you start up the container and point it to the installer. It then pulls everything down into, 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 into a workspace. And that means that you can then run on, on, on Linux, but also uh, Mac OS and Windows. And the big deal about this is that quite often application developers are more comfortable working in those uh, envir environments. Particularly now, we've, all, we've added uh, support for Node.js projects into DevTool. Quite a few Node.js uh, developers might prefer to be working in Windows. So hopefully that's giving you an overview of what life is like as an application developer for the extensible SDK. So now we're going to look at it from a different view, view, viewpoint. 
what work needs, needs, needs to be done by your uh, distro maintainer to, uh, to, enable, to enable these improved, improved tools. So obviously the first thing the distro maintainer needs to, needs to do is just to build this. So uh, he, will be, uh, he or she will be building a recipe, uh, the image recipe here, and just use minus C, populate SDK EXT. It's as simple as that to get a default uh, extensible ST, SDK. Now when I say default, that means it, call, it includes every, everything, a bit like the standard SDK does, all the tools, all the host tools, the native tools, I should, be, I, sh I should say, that are required to build the image plus all the libraries and applications that are in it. Staller will end up in TMP deploy SDK, and you need to make that uh, installer available to your devel developers. And that's the installer that I showed you being used earlier on in the, in the presentation. So now we're going to talk about how do we, how do we customize it. So by default, I mentioned you get the full installer. So that'll be, you know, your, mm, the gigabytes of data. Say you want to access uh, the small installer. You give your um, app, you know, your app developers the, the small installer I was talking about. Uh, in this case, in your local.conf or however you're choosing to configure, you just set the SDK EXT type to minimal. And now you will have a small, in, a small installer. And we'll talk about updating later how you can configure that. You can also, if you want to, add a tool chain to the, to the installer. It's obviously going to make it quite a lot larger than uh, your 35 megabytes. But if you want, you can, you can add that in. Again, just a simple one-liner in your, in your local.conf SDK, SDK include tool, tool, tool chain. Another tip is to add all the, the package info. So what this is, this is doing, it's doing an equivalent, sort of like uh, making you do a bit big world. Uh, so in other words, it is generating the package info, but not doing the full packaging for all the packages and all the, all the layers. So obviously, as a distro maintainer, this is going to take you quite a long time to build, but it's quite a nice thing to do because then your application developers will have access to all the packages you could possibly build, not just the ones that you think they should have. And then if you want to customize further, you can add specific tools or libraries. You can use uh, SDK extra, extra tools. Now an, an example would be here is that say uh, the venerable core, core image minimal, or even I think core image base. Uh, they're mainly auto tools pr projects. But let's say you're giving a base SDK and somebody wants to add an application that's got CMake in it. Wouldn't it be good if you made CMake available to that person, that, that developer? You can just add it, add it in here as native SDK CMake. You can also add specific libraries if you, if you want to by using the uh, toolchain host task variable. Yeah? If the minimum SDK doesn't include toolchain. Yes. So what it, what it, what it has is, uh, that's a good, a good, a good qu question. So it, it has a dev tool in it and enough of the metadata so that when you would run dev tool for the first time, like earlier on I said dev tool add BB, BB example. So dev tool will say, ah, that's an auto tools project. I need the tool chain for that. So it's going to pull the tool chain down everything that's required to build that project. So now you're going to have a lot more than 35 megabytes in it. But the reason for that is that you might not be doing any auto tools work. You might be a Python guy. So if you're a Python guy, why do you want to install all the tool chain? So, but I, I take your point. It's, uh, and so the point of this slide, thank you for the, the question, the point of this slide is to showing you how you can put as much or as little as you want into the installer. You probably know your application developer target, so you can say, well, I think all these guys need a tool chain, so let's add it. And it's really up to you as, as a distro a developer. So I've talked a lot about the update. How does all this stuff work? So the first thing you need to do, uh, shoot.
OK, so the question was that if you, inst if you prepare an SDK install that's got more than just the minimal amount in it, can the person installing it p pick and choose what's in the SDK? And the answer is no, they can't. Uh, you ask the, the distro maintainer, we'll build an installer, and whatever is in that is, in, is installed, which is kind of quite a nice sort of segue to say that that's the attraction of the minimal installer because then you're only going to get what you need. The problem is, is that when you do the BB example thing, the first time you do the dev tool ad, there'll be a bit of a pause whilst it goes out to network and pulls, and pulls everything, everything down. And I'll shortly talk about why it doesn't need to build stuff, uh, tools-wise. OK, so now we're talking about the updater. So what happens here, you need to define a URL. Um, your application developers don't need to be aware of this unless you're having multiple versions. So I think it's safer. Let's just say for, for this example, you can just specify the URL. And by default, when they call their update, they're going to use the URL embedded in the installer. So they don't need to remember any, any magic address. So you just set that URL in your configuration. Again, it's of local.conf here. So SDK update your, your URL. You go and do your build, bit bake minus C, populate SDK EXT. After you've done, here comes the extra step. So you run the command OE publish SDK. You point it to your installer, but you also have to specify an output path. So this is when it put this is where it puts all the published artifacts. And all these artifacts have to then be put onto the web server so they're served up at the location defined by your update URL. So this means now, when you're actually using it, the dev tool SDK update, it will automatically now go to this URL. And by looking at the metadata it's got locally available, the metadata on the server is going to see, are there any differences? Is there any metadata updates I want to do? And I stress, when you run the SDK update, it will not actually pull any packages down. It will just sync the metadata. Think. APT get update. OK, so once you've made all these changes, you published, you can let your uh, app, de app develop developers know. But really, they should also be in a paradigm, the wrong word, they should be in the habit of doing regular SDK updates. Because all it's doing is syncing metadata. You're not going to lose, lose, lose much time. So do that every morning, every hour, how often you want. So we talked about download of stuff on demand here. So the BB example, you've got your 35 megabyte installer. You do dev tool add, BB example. So it says auto tools projects. I need the tool chain. So let's download the tool, tool chain. So it's not going to download all of that and build it, because that would take ages. So it'll download the pre-built um, tool, tool chain. Now, what's useful here is the concept of shared state, where there's pre-built obj objects. Now, those of you who've lived sort of a distro maintainer will be well aware of shared, shared state. Those of you in the app developer land will not be so familiar. But all this really means is, is this is the output of all the build that's, 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 that, that has been going on which has been uh, executed by the, the distro developer. There's a, a, a signature checking system that makes sure that it's going to be, that it's going to match the object that you actually need. Um, so it means that when you come to build and link stuff, uh, everything has been built, uh, built already. It's just there available for you. And the only delay is the network time taken to download that. So you can see an example here. Let's say you're building a QMU x86 target for a core image minimal, my pretty vanilla uh, development machine for core uh, i7. takes about 35 minutes with, with S state. All it's doing is taking down all those objects and assembling them. It takes about a minute. So this shows you how it's going to accelerate, accelerate your, your time. So as a distro a developer, obviously, you need to make this estate mirror uh, available. And again, your app developer doesn't need to know any of these UR, your URLs. It's all baked into the installer. So again, you set this, you choose a, a, U, a URL. 
This time, you have to use a bit of a special configuration file because you don't want it clashing with any SD mirror that you may be using yourself as the distro developer. So it goes into a different file, sdkextra.conf, and uh, then, then do, your, do your build, then uh, build the SDK, minus C populate uh, SDK EXT. After that, make sure the SD cache is served up at the location that you've defined. So now let's try and pull everything together. Uh, so this is going to sort of show a workflow of a distro maintainer and a number of uh, developers who are dependent on each other's, um, each other's components. So we have a number, of, a number of actors in this scenario. So we have uh, Bubba, who is the distro engineer, the distro uh, maintainer I've, I, I've been talking about. You have Joe, he is developing a C library. Let's say it's a, a sensor library. You've got Laurie, who's a Python app developer. And then you've got a third party uh, JavaScript a develop, a developer here. For this flow, we've assumed all the app, app, app developers have already done the initial install of the ESD, ESD, ESDK. So now they're in the update and build cycle. So we start off with Bubba makes it, makes it ESDK, the bit big minus C populate SDK EXT, and he's, um, he's, he's published that up to the ES, ESDK server. Joe does his SDK updates, and now he knows he's got the latest version of the, of the, of the e ESDK. So he, used, uh, he uses the uh, dev tool add, points to his sensor library. So he then generates a, res a recipe, builds, builds and debugs using the dev tool workflow I, I touched on earlier. And then when the library is ready, he uses dev tool finish, which finalizes the recipe and patches, and then he sends the recipe to Bubba. However, he's agreed to do that via pull request or whatever. So then um, Bubba does his builds. Let's say Joe's been a good boy, has provided tests. They all passed, everything is looking good. So then Bubba publishes the revised uh, ES, ES, ESDK. Now it's got Joe's library in it. So Laurie and Betsy can now update their, their ES, ESDKs. So they've now got Joe's access to Joe's library. They use DevToolAd to generate uh, the recipes. And they then build their apps, which are now using Joe's, Joe's library. Uh, here, we, here we go, the build and, build and debug cycle. And then when the apps, apps, apps are done, they do their own dev tool finish. They work with Bubba, send it up, send it up to him. And uh, he turns the crank and ships the product image. And as you know, it's all that easy. So, uh, so that was a joke. Um, okay, so let's uh, <laughs> let's let's uh, let's wrap up. How am I doing for time? Um, so uh, just recap over the benefits of the of the extensible SDSDK. Hopefully that workflow um, the workflow slides showed you how it gives you a shared a development environment. Also gives you access to the power of of DevTool, much uh, you know a much a much a much better environment than their simple tool tool chain. We've seen how improves, improve, improve the workflow, how everything happens quickly through using a shared state, and also through the container, we can now run on a range of host op operating system. Okay, so wrapping up, I'd like to give a thanks to Paul Eggleton. He's the maintainer and sort of current owner of the extensible SDK. R Randy Witt, who did a lot of the uh, early work on the, on the ES ESDK, and helped me out with a lot of the technical details. I'm more of a user of this stuff and actually a core developer of it. And I don't know if Randy's in the audience, uh, but we might, we might need to call, call him for answers. Um, Brian Avery, who helped me tell a story here. And uh, Doug Martin, who helped me with those wonderful build slides. So the call to action is simply you move over to using the extensible SDK. I saw in the audience at the start, not many of you have played with this. I encourage you to give it Give it a shot. 
uh, you see what they can do for you beyond a simple tool, tool chain, and it can run uh, using the same environment uh, on Windows, Windows and Mac. So the, the, the QR code here, which will take you to this sort of landing page on our, on our wiki, where I've tried to summarize uh, <clears throat> a number of articles, the right appropriate parts of the, of the Yocto project manual, the SDK manual is the best place, the best place to go for this. Uh, some t tips and tricks, and also uh, a pointer back to this slideshow that's not yet available on the ELC website. And uh, with that, uh, I'm done and would like to take any questions, Chef. So I, I noticed that with the uh, with your Joe example, yes. that you had a big wall with a third party JS uh, yes. part of it. How, how does uh, the ESDK help me when our team develops source code, but we have a third party vendor who can't necessarily see all of the source code, but they need all the binaries? Right. Okay. So that would work out um, in that in that in that instance instance there. I would have to say I'm not quite. I think you can set things up so when you do the SDK install, uh, I'll need to check on this, but you saw the minus S option in there, you want to be disabling that. I want to ask the, ask the, the, the distro maintainer, I want to find out if that can be disabled. And so that means all they can do is install the binaries, so they cannot install the source. If you can yeah. capture that question and get back to me, I'd love to make sure because that's a really good request, really good, uh, solid feature request right there. I'm not sure if we can support or not. Yes. Um, yeah, so w what is the limitation of the updatability? I mean, I guess you cannot like jump from like one version to the next using update, or can you do that? W what are the limitations there? Oh, do you mean running from, say, you're on Yocto 2.1 and you move to 2.2? For instance. That is a good question. I, I would doubt you can do an update. Okay. Uh, I have not tried that. I'm just thinking that you're in a build environment and you're just improving things from a middleware aspect, okay. a so, middleware and driver aspect. Okay. okay. So maybe distro features would be okay still? I believe distro yeah. features ought to be okay. okay, yes. Okay, good, thanks. Hello, uh, one of the things you mentioned was uh, that the shared state cache uh, for this should not be shared with the main one. Uh, is there a particular reason for that? Yes, yeah, so uh, the question was that when you're pr preparing the installer, the way you configure the shared state cache that will be used by the ESDK users is differentiated from the S state mirror that you as the, as the distro developer are, are, are using. Well, in theory, I guess they could, they could be the same. I'm just showing how you could keep a partition if you wanted. But I believe they could be the same. Just a question. Um, is there a mechanism to uh, maybe go to a fixed point in time of the state of the extensible SDK to be able to reproduce a build? Okay, so the question here was, can you go back to a fixed state in time and reproduce a build? So I guess the solution to that would be that each time you produce the installer, you had an option to generate a URL. So when you do an update, you do, you know, your, your kind of update is Rev 1, Rev 2, Rev 3, Rev 4. And I think the only way you could do it is get somebody to, because you can't roll back with the installer just now. So they probably would have to blow away their environment and then install Rev X. And then they'd be back to a known place. So that's a good, we have discussed internally, is there any rollback mechanism? You know, I mean, that's a, that's a very good, that's another, feature request I need to make a note of, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, so one of the reasons why there actually was the third party uh, wall was because of uh, work we've done together. Um, and so one of the ideas there is actually uh, Bubba is just going to build 
two different URLs for the SDK, right? One of them is source of, sor with sources for the internal people, and the other one's only binaries. Cool. Okay, those were some great, great, great uh, questions. So as I mentioned, uh, we want to make this usable for people. We want to encourage people to use it. Um, I think the big strength, as I mentioned, is uh, hopefully you saw the build-out slides towards the end. It's just creating an, uh, it's creating a shrink-wrapped distro environment, distro developer environment that app developers can, can use. And even if you want people to help you modify or upgrade res recipes, you can, from a, not even from an app a developer perspective, but if your time is too short, as the, the, the distro maintainer, you want to farm out outer, outer work, just generate an ESD, ESDK. And that's the easiest, fastest way to replicate the exact environment you're working in. I think another point that Henry brought up uh, that's really <coughs> important is this minimal SDK, extensible SDK, because it gets to be small, right? Because anybody who's looked at the Yocto project produced ES, extensible SDKs, they're you know, 2.1 gigs and so on, right? Because there's a lot of stuff in there. And so that led to an impression that extensible SDK is therefore very large, right? That's not true. The, the reality is it, it's easier with a um, server, you know, webhook type situation where you're actually going to get the data from an update server. So that's really the mechanism you should be thinking about internally in your, your teams is uh, providing that. And it's as easy as Python-M simple HTTP server 8080 or whatever and in the right directory and it serves it up for you. So it, you can do this pretty quickly without having to set up yeah, uh, and one, one, Apache. And one more question about that is that in Randy's example, uh, when he did the extensible SDK in the container, he pointed at the uh, installers generated by the Yocto auto builders. There's a bug open because they're not yet generating minimal installers. So the only one you'll find out for, uh, for the Morty builds, I believe it's still building only a full installer. But hopefully in a few weeks' time, that should be resolved. Uh, one quick question. I've got a team that's a bit spread out. They're, they're not all in one location. Is there a straightforward way of um, doing authentication credentials in this? Or is that to be released at some future point? Or is that a great idea for a pull request? Or Right. That is a great idea for a pull request. Okay. And thank you for offering. <laughs> what do you mean? What, what do you mean by that? The question was, what does an SDK build for Windows look like? I should have clarified the question before repeating it. Yeah. Uh, so if you generate, uh, if you generate an SDK with cross compilers that could actually run on Windows, well, shell script's not going to work to install those. Oh so, well. So currently, our approach, the current approach we have, is to run within the container. So we don't do that. So we're going away. The Windows support. And Mac support is going away from Meta MinGW, away from Meta Darwin. So we're just taking the Linux tool chain and running it in a container. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're not running, it's not running natively on Windows. I don't know if natively is the right word to use here, but it's not running on Windows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a, sorry, that was a bad option. Um, so yeah, so we're running everything in a container just because we're not having to spread ourselves so thin in terms of maintaining the meta MinGW, which you know would always fall into disrepair. I know that because I try I tried to use it a few a few a few times. Meta Darwin, I don't know if that guy works or not. But anyway, this is the way forward through the through the containers. And I would believe those layers will be not be getting so much love from the Intel Yocto team as we focus on the container solution. Okay. So MSYS2 actually lets you run some shell scripts and things like that. And you'll think, oh, that'll just work, right? <coughs> but the reality is then it's going to get into file system problems because the native file system doesn't support it. And so 
that's the Windows side of it. And on the Mac side of it, with MetaDarwin, you've got Apple is not open source. And so we don't know what they're doing. And so we're guessing. And therefore, we get into things that we can't control anymore. And so those two situations just keep churning and burning our developers. And we, just, we, we need to be having them focus on other things. And yet, we still want to support the users that do want to use Windows and Mac. And uh, so we've actually been working on the Windows and Mac solution with containers for a while now. Um, but what Randy presented today is actually the simplest solution. It actually works the best uh, compared to some other things we did try that we even presented last year. So um, that's really a recommended way to go. And, and I, I think all of us can tell you that we've been doing it natively on those OSs as part of our development workflow. So you know, I just have a Xeon box in a closet that's running um, my estate mirror, and I'm doing my actual development on my Mac, because that's my actual day-to-day -day work. Actually, I'd like to ask a question, if you don't mind. When I asked for the hands up, who'd use the SDK, standard SDK, a lot of hands went up. So when you guys had done your work, and then you needed to create a recipe to add whatever you'd done into the image, did you learn how to use create a bit big recipe, or did you just point your distro maintainer buddy at your source code and tell him to figure it out, or what generally solution do people have before DevTool add? Uh, so what we did in our organization was we actually, uh, and when I say we, I mean I did this, uh, created a Debian installer uh, so we would take the, the SDK installers, uh, okay. we were working in Dizzy, take the SDK installers, install those on a platform, and then minimize and scrape that and package it into a Debian package, Whoa. put that in a Debian repository and notify our developers, okay, if you're using this version of the OS, right. because we tagged the OS with a particular version, then you need to use this SDK, right. and so they would have to install that in their workstation. Okay, okay. Yep, so when hopefully, hopefully DevTool, I see, is a key part of the ESDK, and hopefully that's going, to, uh, that's going to sort of smooth the road between application developers doing their thing, and then how does the magic that they've added, the differentiator of the product, how does that get back into the image? And that's what we're all about trying to help make easier. Did anybody else have another approach? Or? OK. Um, so my Someone team lead would like to know, how many of you want to be using an IDE like Eclipse? Specifically, how many of you want to be using the IDE called Eclipse? Let's clarify that. How many of us want to use it, and how many of us OK. <laughs> that is actually the question I'm asking. Thank you for it. So rewording, how many of you have teams, have users who want to be using Eclipse that you need to be supporting? OK. Thank you. Yes, that was a much better question. Um, so what about like VS, um, VS Code or something like that? Is there, is there interest in that area? OK, well, I'm asking for, <coughs> we're trying to get a feel for what actual IDEs are in the wild and what, what people are actually trying to support, because um, we poured a lot of resources into Eclipse at times over the past few years. And it's really, really hard to continue to maintain it. And we're not sure if people are using it. One of the problems with an open source project where you've just got a website and people can pull stuff down, you don't actually know how many users you have and how they're using it. And so we come to these things and we do get some feedback from people. But we don't always know if anybody's actually using it because Sometimes uh, people don't want to send questions to the mailing list or whatever, and so we just don't know. And so we spend time working on something, and then we don't know if that was valuable time or not. So that I, we did get a good enough feel, though, because it's probably about 40% of the audience here was. OK, the key creator, so. Ooh. Ooh. OK, that's a pretty good number. That's about 20%. Um, so VS Code, I saw only some shaking heads, so, <laughs> so not Shit, there yet. Uh, what <laughs> about, um, uh, what's PyCharm based on? Um, yeah. 
sea lion <laughs> and okay, it's a couple floats. Idea J is what I was thinking. Of, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Oh yeah, VI. Okay, VI. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and yes, and my my technical lead would not let me leave the room without asking for Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Perverts. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, okay. thank you guys. Okay, thank you.